Everyone, it's my pleasure to introduce Rami Mavatha, who's going to be speaking about Kelly-Pars of quantum supremacy. This is a very interesting paper, um, talking about a uh, key problem related to this issue of quantum computational supremacy. I mean, I'm presuming it's mostly going to be about how you can prove theorems around the average case complexity of the problems that underlie sure. these experiments that Google and others have talked about. All right, so uh, Rami, take it away. All right, thanks a lot, Nick. It's great to be back here. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of you may remember me. I'm Rami Smavasa from, I'm in the US now, um, calling you from yesterday, uh, July 2nd at night. So it's good to be back. Uh, I visited you guys last year, gave a couple of talks, and it was a lot of fun. So I'll, let's just get into it. Um, the idea is that the quantum computers are here now. Um, they are not fault tolerant, but they have some good number of qubits you can operate on. And of course, these quantum computers capable of performing certain tasks that are practically, that is in reasonable time, impossible on any class computer. And <clears throat> church, extended church Turing thesis says, you know, anything that happens in nature, roughly speaking, anything that happens in nature, you can uh, calculate in uh, with polynomial overhead on a on a Turing machine. So a lead candidate to show quantum supremacy is a so-called random circuit sampling. It's the task that Google recently made a splash about on. So you know you run a circuit that's random and you do sampling from its output, and it's supposed to be hard. And I'm going to say what exactly these things mean. And that's going to be the focus of the talk today. So to state the problem. Um, to state the problem, so, so let me just recap since we got disconnected. The idea is to show that quantum computers are capable of performing certain tasks in a way that's not tractable for classical computers. It would take too long. The task could be absolutely useless, which seems to be the case uh, with random circuits, but it would prove the skeptics wrong that you know, quantum computers are somehow not powerful or you know, they cannot do much. Um, so it's important to get this separation and show that there's actually some inherent quantum power that is absent otherwise, classically. So to state the problem in some mathematical way that we can make progress on, let me introduce a circuit first. So in quantum computation, usually time runs on, runs on the horizontal axis, and this is an architecture of a circuit. So if you have these qubits, one, two, all the way to n, and you have a placeholder for where you would put the gates, then this thing is called a blueprint or an architecture of a circuit without specifying what the gates are, what the computation is. But once you specify the actual gates, maybe you know this is a, this is a bit flip, it's an X, or this is a C naught or what have you. Uh, every, once you specify every one of the gates, this architecture gets instantiated by a circuit that we can implement in the lab. And you, know, you write it as C for circuit. And if every one of the local gates say every CK is a random unitary drawn independently from the space of all unitaries, that is from the Haar measure, uh, then we say the circuit is as generic, as random as it gets, respecting that particular architecture. So the most, uh, the most generic operation you could do is one gigantic unitary, two to the n by two to the n unitary on the n qubits. But that is not what we do in quantum computation. We have these local gates, and you may ask, well, you know, in the space of all possible local gates, what is the most generic? What is really average case? That is, if you put your hands fixed in the architecture, you pull out a circuit, um, what kind of a distribution are you drawing it from? And this H sub A that you see on top um, is that distribution where every one of the gates is independent, uniformly drawn from uh, space of unitaries. So it's hard, but res um, respecting that architecture A. And like every other quantum computation, you start from all zeros, you run the computation, you measure and you interpret the results. The idea is that to come up with a classical algorithm that gives you, so once you run a quantum computation computer and you measure, you get a string out from some probability distribution that's induced by the circuit. And the, the um, task is to come up with a classical algorithm that gives you strings from a distribution, some other distribution, that mimics the distribution of the quantum computer very closely. So mathematically saying some small total variation distance. 
So you want to prove that there is no classical randomized algorithm that gives you, that performs random circuit sampling efficiently. That is, provides you with samples or strings um, from a distribution that's close to the output distribution of the quantum circuit. Now, via a Stockmeyer reduction, I mean, I can get more into this if there is interest, but I'm trying to keep the talk at a higher level. But the contrapositive to this is that, so if you could sample efficiently by Stockmeyer, if you can sample efficiently to some specific approximation, by a Stockmeyer, then you can calculate probability amplitudes. And by a hiding property, so these are just words, it turns out that it's enough to calculate this particular prob uh, probability. So you start from all zeros, you run the circuit, then you measure zeros. What's the probability of this, um, what's the probability amplitude on this process? The, the statement is that there exists an architecture, A, such that computing this is sharply hard. Sharply hard means like harder than NP, it's supposed to be really hard, assuming some very basic complexity theoretical assumptions. As long as the circuit is drawn from, some, from, from the most generic distribution with respect to that architecture. That is, it's an average case circuit. Now, it turns out because of Stockmeyer, this is not quite enough. What you need is really this probability to within some additive error, all right? Um, and this error is some very particular number that I'm intentionally not telling you right now because I think it's too early to talk about, um, you know, two to the n and et cetera. So I just wanna tell you that there's a specific epsilon. So you wanna show not only this point is hard, that a whole inner wall neighborhood around it is indeed sharply hard for any classical computer to mimic. All right. The contrapositive to statement is that if this is hard, then sampling is hard. So the hardness of this proves the hardness of sampling. That's why we focus on this probability amplitude. And today we're going to do exactly that. Uh, we'll show that there exists an architecture, a, and this relates to some of the works of uh, uh, Mick Bremner and colleagues that there is existing in an architecture such that computing this probability is indeed very hard. This, let's call it exact without the error. And then I'll also prove that not only this point is hard, but there's a whole neighborhood of it, it that is hard. But the neighborhood I have succeeded in proving is slightly short of what you need for the actual quantum supremacy conjecture to be true. And um, interestingly enough, the numerical algorithms that have been coming out recently seem to indicate that actually once you leave this neighborhood I'm going to prove to you, things start getting easy. So in some sense, at least for constant depth circuits, we're starting to believe that indeed um, what we hoped would be true for quantum supremacy uh, may not actually be true. So that is, it may be false for constant depth circuits. But that's another uh, story that will come back in a little, a little later. But everything I'm gonna tell you, I believe is true and it's got proofs. So we'll prove this point is hard and a neighborhood of it. And I'll specify and quantify all of this. But that's the overview. Um, so let's talk about that point for now before the uh, actual neighborhood. So how can one hope to prove such a thing, all right? How can we prove that this quantity is hard for circuits that are average? So I'm sure this audience has people from computer science, math, and physics. One way to do this is using a, a reduction in computer science that some of you may know very well, some of you may not. And the idea is that there exists some worst case circuit, you would call it. So first of all, complexity theory results are worst case statements. If you say the following, if you say three sat is NP complete, what it means is that among the n instances of n sat, there exists some that are NP complete. There are some that are trivial, but in the worst case, it's NP complete. Now here, we happen to know that there exists some very deterministic particular circuit C. Here, this circuit is not hard anymore. It's just some circuit for which indeed calculating these to even some approximation is sharply hard. So there's some famous circuit out there. So for constant depth circuits, you can look at the work of Terhold de Vincenzo, which was ahead of its time. And like Bremner, Joseph Shepard, is another work that um, is based on IQP circuits and they talk about the hardness of worst case and um, show that it's uh, equivalent to calculating a partition function of some hard problem that's sharply hard. Now we wanna grab these and show that that sh specific sharply hard circuit is generically um, 
So that is this probability amplitude is not just hard for the Sharpie hard circuit, that's a very specific example, but actually it is the case if you take that circuit with that architecture, you replace all its gates with random gates. So you wanna show that if you have that circuit that we know is Sharpie hard, you replace all its gates with random gates, this quantity is still Sharpie hard for any classical computer to estimate. Now this is an overview, so how would you do such a thing? Well, one way to do it is you, you do an idea that's um, attributed to Lipton often. Um, so you grab the circuit, you deform it. That is you deform every one of the gates in some particular way, hope, hoping that you can do this. I haven't told you how, but suppose there is a way you can do this for some theta parameterization. Where at theta equals one, you recover the deterministic case that is known to be worst case hard. So it's one of these circuits, say. And at theta equals zero, it just happens that uh, the circuit at theta equals zero will be the same architecture as this well-known worst case, but every one of its gates is from the hard measure and independently, okay? I haven't told you how to do this, but suppose that were the case. So we have a parameterization that relates the worst case now to the average case. At zero, you have an average case circuit with the same architecture, and at one, you have the worst case circuit. Now, how would you um, do this? One thing for sure is that you want to respect the architecture. That is, if this is my worst case circuit, I'm gonna do the parameterization in such a way that every one of the gates is deformed, all right? So it respects the architecture. Now, how can, how can one possibly reduce the complexity of the worst case to average case? The idea of Lipton, which is actually in hindsight fairly natural, um, but you know, here it is. Suppose for the sake of argument, it turns out, as I'll show you in a second, actually polynomials don't work. But suppose for the sake of argument that this P0 of theta, all right, which is a result. So if P0 of C used to be worst case, and as you deform it, naturally P0 will also be a function of theta. Suppose it happens um, by fiat for now, that is a polynomial of low degree in theta. Low degree for us quantum computation people means like it's poly n, say, all right? So it's, it's some polynomial of low degree. This is a polynomial of low degree for you. And at theta equals one, we know by construction that this is a Sharpie hard instance. Maybe it's Bremner, Josa, Shepard, or maybe it's Terhal, Vincenzo if it's a constant depth circuit. And by construction, we know that at theta equals zero, we have ourselves um, <clears throat> average case circuits. There's random circuits. I haven't told you again how to construct this, but suppose it is the case. We can build this and we know now by construction at near theta equals zero, it is an instance of average case circuit. Okay. Now, given this polynomial of low degree, this is how the proof goes. It goes by contradiction. Suppose indeed these are easy. Suppose there exists a classically efficient algorithm O that calculates P zero of theta at zero or very near zero, arbitrarily close to zero, within a delta, capital delta neighborhood of zero, where capital delta is little o of one. Maybe capital delta is one over poly n, okay? So it's like arbitrarily close to average case circuits. Suppose there exists a classical algorithm that could calculate. You give it a theta, it gives you a P0 of theta. Well, then you can just, if P0 of theta is a polynomial of degree d, little d, for the sake of argument. So any polynomial of degree D has D plus one coefficients. Do you agree? There is A zero plus A one theta plus A two theta squared plus dot, 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 A sub D theta to the D. So there are D plus one coefficients. Every theta I pick near zero, it gives me a P of theta I. So if I evaluate this polynomial at D plus one points, I can, I have a linear system now in the coefficients of the polynomial, A zero to AD. And linear systems are O and Q. You know, you can just solve them. Um, so with polynomial amount of time, I can set up this linear system and solve for the coefficients and therefore write down P0 of theta exactly and in poly n time because the degree was poly n. So the size of these linear solvers, the size of the equation is poly n and there's only uh, D plus one of them, which is poly n. So I can do the whole thing in poly n work, okay? Because the degree is not very large. But if I can write it down exactly, if I can then evaluate the polynomial exactly, 
Well, I just plug, I can always plug in theta equals one in what I obtained and evaluate the Sharpie hard point. Since I have this analytically or whatever, I can plug in theta equals one and evaluate this number. And that would be a solution to a Sharpie hard problem. Now, this cannot be unless, you know, the polynomial hierarchy collapses to the third level. That is by doing, by, by assuming an efficient algorithm, efficient, you know, poly n number of points and efficient computation, I ended up calculating something that's believed not to be efficient. And that's a contradiction. So one way to give is to say, well, look, the polynomial hierarchy just collapsed. Well, we don't believe that's the case. We go with a more viable answer and we say, well, if we assume the polynomial hierarchy doesn't collapse, which is something that predates quantum computing, um, then what could have gone wrong? I mean, the degree was low, linear solvers are linear solvers. This assumption must give that, you know, there exists or there could exist, whatever ingenious an algorithm it may be, there could exist some ingenious algorithm that calculates P0 of theta very near zero. So these points could not have all been easy. Some of them should have had as uh, much complexity as the sharp B point. Therefore, by contradiction, there does not exist a classical algorithm O that can efficiently calculate P0 of theta near zero. Or if it did, it would co collapse the polynomial hierarchy. Okay, so that's the idea of the reduction. But maybe I can pause for a second here. Is there any question about what I've said so far? You're welcome. So like Nick said earlier, you know, just like interrupt and ask questions. I, I much rather not finish a talk and have an audience than just like go through results. But this is just background about like how this reduction goes. And I like the slide because, you know, um, I mean, I don't know, I, I learned about reduction at some point in my life and it helps. So maybe somebody else also got something out of it. I can pause for a, for a few seconds if there's any questions. Um, Ramis? Yes, please. So I have a question. Um, so if, if there's some uh, errors in estimating the uh, value right. of PCI, um, how, like, I guess when you do interpretation, the error would be out of control. So how do you handle that's that? That's right. Well, that's an excellent question. It's very important. And errors are key because um, um, the, it's the issue of so-called robustness. So you want to show that this quantity so you're a little bit ahead now. This quantity is hard, not just for the exact point, but also plus minus epsilon, which is something I alluded to earlier on in my talk, that to within some additive area is still hard. But I have intentionally not talked about, I have intentionally skipped talking about the errors just yet, but I will talk about them because they're indeed important. And for the actual hardness by Stockmire, you need some, um, you need hardness despite some errors in this evaluation. But if you let me, I'd rather not talk about errors just yet because it'll just confuse the other people. Okay. But I will talk about them. Is that okay with you? Yeah, sure. I want to focus on the exact case for now and come back to the errors towards the end to talk about robustness. But okay. that's a very key issue and it's an astute observation. So it's good that you brought everybody, uh, made everybody sensitive to it. So yes, the question is, you know, what happens if this, you know, you ask, you call the algorithm, you give it a theta, it gives you P0 of theta, but you know, it messes up a little bit like every algorithm would. Um, what then? Is there still such a reduction? And we'll talk about it. Any other questions? All right. So, so far we've gone on this assumption that, you know, what if this were a polynomial, then this whole thing would work. But I mean, can we really deform a circuit in such a way that this quantity comes out as a polynomial? Um, so how are we to do this deformation? And remember that we do things in a way that respects uh, loca uh, the architecture. That is every one of the gates, which is a two by two or a four by four matrix. So capital N here is two or four. Two if it's a one qubit gate, four if it's a two qubit gate. And this is supposed to show unitary group. And the idea was that at theta equals one, it recovers the famous deterministic point, the Sharpie hard point, whose worst case that is the worst case. And at theta equals zero, it'll be an instance of average case circuit. That is, it'll be a random gate, random unitary gate. But can we really do, construct something that is indeed a polynomial? And I'll show you in a second that polynomials have issues, but it's possible to come up with low degree algebraic functions that are as good. Um, but 
far more technical. And uh, so how are we to do that? So I got ahead of myself. So at one is, see, is the worst case and at theta equals zero. So this is interesting. At theta equals zero, if you happen to have CK, which is the worst case gate, times a gate that is absolutely random, it's from the Haar measure, the product is from the Haar measure. It's random Haar by the definition of Haar measure. Haar measure is defined to be translational invariant. That is, if you multiply a uh, Haar measure, a, a unitary from the Haar measure to any deterministic unitary, you get something from the Haar measure, from the unit uniform spin. That is like, it just spins it uniformly. But can we do this? Okay. So what predates this work, among many other works, like boson sampling first started, then there was this nice work of IQP circuits by Bremner uh, and others, and then there was the average case um, for, for the IQP circuit. Um, the good thing about IQP circuit was that the anti-concentration was known as shown, whereas for boson sampling, average case was not known, nor was um, anti-concentration known. But then there was random circuit sampling, which is the task that Google focused on. Um, and it kind of is the encompassing, uh, it's an encompassing example because um, we have anti-concentration works for it. And the gates are really from the space of all gates, like IQP circuits. One thing I really like about them is that they're kind of classical, but they're very hard and that's very attractive. But for um, quantum supremacy, um, um, as, as a quantum supremacy candidate, you also, it's kind of, nice to to have that the most generic circuits which are these random circuits that kind of encompass all these other models have hardness um, and we have anti-concentration average case was not known and the work that predates my work is this nice work of my colleagues Bulan, Pfefferman, Nierke and Vazirani where they they did the following I want to explain it um, and then I'll get into my own work so one way to relate these two points is you grab your sharp p hard instance you multiply it by hard measure and then and then you multiply the result by e to the minus i theta little h sub k they call it t i call it theta this by construction so little h sub k by construction is such that at theta equals one e to the minus i little h sub k is this capital h sub k dagger okay so at theta equals one, this and this cancel each other. You just get C sub K and that's the worst case instance. And at theta equals zero, well, this is just identity and the product of anything with har is har, okay? Now you might see that the issue with this is that this is, this is no polynomial. This is an infinite power series and it breaks the reduction. Remember that we wanted this whole thing, parameterization to kind of be polynomial. Um, but this is not. In order to get a polynomial, well, what they did is they Taylor expand this quantity and they chop it off. So that is, you know, you go up to some poly, poly order. So what used to be a product of unitary times unitary times unitary, which is a unitary, becomes a unitary times a unitary times something that is not a unitary anymore. So as soon as you leave theta equals zero, you kind of leave the unitary group and what used to be a quantum circuit will become something that is, I mean, if I were standing in front of you, I would use my hands, but it becomes a code and code circuit because every one of the gates is now non-unitary and their product is non-unitary. So this is the same picture. Um, remember that H sub K by definition is such that at theta equals one, it becomes HK dagger. And everything is fine if you don't, if you just take the geodesic, that's e to the minus i theta hk, that's a geodesic, whatever, it's differential geometry. Um, at theta goes one, it gives you c sub k, and at theta goes zero is har, but this doesn't work because there's no polynomial here. So what they do is that they Taylor expand, and I'm repeating myself, and chop after L terms. This is an infinite series, but if you chop it off after L terms, you get an approximation of your gate that's non-unitary and therefore the circuit is non-unitary. So the goal, if you recall from beginning, was to show that this point is hard and an epsilon neighborhood of it, where now that you know we're more into the talk, I actually tell you what that epsilon is. Every one of these probabilities is about two to the minus n, right? Because we have a random circuit. And you wanna be able to tell one from the other within one over poly n. So it's the, this neighborhood is two to the minus n over poly n. 
So what they end up showing is the hardness of a nearby point because this C tilde is not C anymore. But you know, by taking uh, the truncation large enough, you can actually get exponentially close to P0 of C, that's fine. Um, so the distribution over C tilde is close in distribution, but it's, it's not really comparable in some ways because it's not unitary. So I, I don't know what it means for it to be close, but uh, it, you know, you can make the norm small and stuff. And they actually prove that P0 of C tilde is hard, but there is a big assumption that goes in. And I wanna show you why, you know, and therefore the point of my work is that to show that P0 of, P0 of C tilde even is hard, you need to make a very strong assumption. And that assumption is, all right, that assumption is here, you would need to assume that you have a classical algorithm that takes in the non-unitary circuit. All right, so it's a different complexity vehicle assumption. You need to assume that you have a classical algorithm that takes in a non-unitary circuit and evaluates P0 of theta. Therefore, it doesn't really prove the hardness of actual circuits, the average case circuits. So once you follow the reduction, what breaks is the assumption that classically efficiently calculating P0 of theta is, is hard for O that takes in non-unitary circuits, not actual quantum circuits, okay? So that's one limitation. And then um, they prove some epsilon prime, also a small epsilon prime, not something large, but some small epsilon prime. But this epsilon prime was X bob minus poly N. Uh, I could show in my paper that if you, if you um, assume, if you give the algorithm, the so-called O that we assume you know, takes in a non-unitary circuit, if you give it a unitary circuit, right? I mean, you could say it's okay if it succeeds with high probability on unitary circuits. But what I could show is that the only way it can succeed is if the whole thing becomes inefficient. That is, if you were gonna get any little bit of robustness around here by inputting a real circuit, then um, the degree of the polynomial would necessarily need to be exponentially large, ex poly, and I'll, I'll show that in a second. Uh, for later, my student, John Knapp and Aram Harrow and uh, Fernando Brando and others um, built on my argument and gave a more sophisticated argument that showed that even X but poly N won't do to prove any robustness. If you assume, again, if you assume your O takes in a real quantum circuit. But why is that the case? So this goes back to the question that was just asked a second ago. Um, <clears throat> So mm, we have an exact polynomial that we said has a sharp D hard point. What you really need to show is that um, the problem is hard even to within some epsilon, a little bit of error. That is every one of these, the algorithm gives you P of theta I plus minus epsilon I. That would be fine if you, in, you extrapolate. So, you know, by calculating this, you have a polynomial now that you construct that has a little bit of error in its coefficients. And when you put in theta equals one, you ask, well, you know, how bad does it get? And the answer is that it's pretty bad. Um, but the good thing is that we know that the Sharpie hard point has a neighborhood of hardness. That is approximate counting is also hard. So within a factor of two of multiplicative error, this point is hard. So as long as you can extrapolate into this point, you're fine. Now let me show you, um, maybe I pause for a second uh, and take some questions and then say, say a little bit more. I can pause for like a few seconds if there are any questions, comments, before I get into the issue of robustness. Uh, can, can I ask something? Yes, I just got lost in a second when you put the, um... When you give epsilon as two to the minus n divided by poly n, so yeah. why is epsilon? This is so um I... so to prove quantum supremacy, you would need um, there's there's some details with respect to Stockmeyer reduction. Um, so you recall that you want to prove that sampling is hard. You want to show that sampling is hard to within some total variation distance, and to prove that is hard. So if sampling were easy. 
okay? If sampling were easy, then you could calculate these probabilities, but to within this much error. That is like this would be easy, okay? Now, if you, that is equivalent to say that if this is hard, then sampling is hard. That's why this epsilon is something particular. It comes up the algorithm that Larry Stockmeyer gave us, uh, the so-called approximate counting algorithm, the so-called Stockmeyer reduction. Okay, so it's that particular number because Larry said so. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so I guess it comes from the multiplicative approximation, right? That's oh, right, yeah, so um, exactly. So originally you want it from multiplicative approximation of one over poly n, but these, ran and thanks, thanks for bringing this up. Um, so unlike boson sampling, IQP circuits and also random circuits have anti-concentration property. And this anti-concentration property is nifty in that it relates the multiplicative error to additive error, which is attractive because a quantum computer, once you evaluate stuff, you get stuff out of it, it gives you additive error, not multiplicative error. So we can indeed use a Stockmeyer algorithm because we have anti-concentration and we can make the two errors equivalent by mainly that two to the minus n that you see there. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. So <clears throat> let me tell you um, about Peturi's lemma. So suppose, so recall that we are about robustness. What happens if you have a little bit of error? How much does it blow up? Well, <clears throat> suppose this is your exact polynomial. This is the approximate polynomial. So this is maybe the, what color was it? It's the brown and the yellow brown minus yellow. So this difference will be some polynomial that, is, um, that oscillates around zero. So it's a polynomial centered at zero because you know it's one, you subtract one and you just have the fluctuations left, fine. So that gives, difference of polynomial is a polynomial. And so a general lemma due to Paturi says that suppose P of theta now, this P of theta is a degree D, whatever that degree may be, some D polynomial. And Suppose that in the neighborhood around zero, from zero to delta, this polynomial is bounded by epsilon, all right? That is, you know, it's, it's, it's at most epsilon. Then what happens to this polynomial? How much can it wiggle at one? And the answer is that it'll be epsilon times e to the two times the degree, times one plus delta to the minus one. And remember that delta, delta itself is one over poly n, so del inverse is like poly n. So you have D times poly N. So it's a huge blow up. All right, so here I just wrote down the result of, I wanna tell you why truncation has an issue. So I just wrote down Petri's lemma and Petri's lemma is based on uh, Chebyshev polynomial. So the upper bound is tight. If, so now all I'm, so this part I just copied from above, this epsilon here, Suppose you ask the following question. You say, look, fine, I mean, I can truncate, but if I give my classical algorithm a quantum circuit, an actual quantum circuit with n qubits, m total gates, and the truncation order L, if you recall, then it's easy to see, and it's already in their paper too, I mean, this is not a mystery, that the epsilon you introduce by giving the algorithm an actual quantum circuit is this much, okay? Now, what they argued is that, well, that's, that's okay. I can just make, make my L large enough and then just kill this whole thing. Because if L is, you know, poly N of one degree higher than this product and this, then it can win over. But what I realized is that these, these parameters are not all independent. D depends on N, L depends on D. In particular, this degree D if every one of the gates is truncated at L, Lth order, and there are M gates, well, the degree of uh, polyno polynomials is additive, so the degree will be L times M, and the two comes from the fact that you take an absolute value squared. So 
this d will be l dependent and if you take if you just factor out an l you will see that this factor always blows up unless this l right i mean you just solve this and make it zero unless this l is exponentially large in this quantity because then i can take a log and hopefully maybe make this negative enough to overtake this but that would mean that the degree of truncation would have to be exponentially large but if the degree of truncation is exponentially large remember that the whole thing breaks down uh, why because if the degree is exponentially large these d points are not low degree anymore i have I have linear systems that are exponent that have exponentially many coefficients. So uh, this reduction won't work anymore. Even if I assume this, I won't have I won't be able to get from here to here in in um, poly n time because the degrees are exponentially large. Um, okay. So therefore. Um, I'm ready to tell you about my work. Maybe I can pause for a second if you have a little bit, if you have any questions, I can just explain a couple of things. Otherwise, I'll just tell you about Kaylee work. And uh, I mean, maybe a few seconds. All right. So today um, we're going to overcome this. Excuse me, let me just... by using a new path on the unitary group that is based on the Cayley function, and it has advantages beyond just quantum supremacy in that it is a it is a path that remains unitary for all theta. The caveat is that although it's not polynomial, it's the rational function of lowest degree you can imagine. Um, it will be as low a degree as possible. So in some ways, it may be optimal. We'll prove average case hardness, and I'll prove some robustness. So not only will prove the hardness of this particular point, we'll prove a hardness of a neighborhood that is 2 to the minus n cubed. Um, would be nice to do this to prove the supremacy conjecture, but actually it seems like this will never be proved. I mean, the recent numerical algorithms seem to show that as soon as you exit my neighborhood, what I, what I can prove, then things actually become easy. So that's kind of nice, maybe not for supremacy, but maybe for this result. So it's quantifiable and look at, uh, and note that I don't you really use X for poly N, et cetera. So it's some, something quantifiable. And then we'll prove a total variation distance between the circuits and hard circuits of the same architecture. And in order to do this, I had to, um, extend a well-known algorithm in coding theory, which is called Berlick and Welch algorithm, from polynomials to rational functions. Um, and you know, that may be also an independent utility for some people. All right, so Cayley path and quantum supremacy. Cayley function is this simple, beautiful function. It's one plus ix over one minus ix. And if you put in x, any real value x, so this is the real line, you give it any x, it gives you a unique point on a circle in the complex plane, okay? And vice versa, every point here corresponds to a particular x on the real line. So it's really a bijection as soon as you define infinities. So you know you can define f of minus infinity to be this point. And then there's a bijection between real numbers and numbers on the unit circle, Hermitian matrices and unitary matrices. Now, if h is a Hermitian matrix, its eigenvalues are real and, you know, linear algebra says, what do you do to a normal matrix or a Hermitian matrix you do to its eigenvalues? So therefore this H will have the same eigenvectors, but has eigenvalues now that are in the unit circle. So it'll be a unitary. And you can show with a little bit of work, not much work, it's easy to see, that F of minus H is just H dagger. So what is the task? Recall that there is a worst case circuit, C1 to Cn. And then we generate M corresponding random Haar gates, H1 to HM. This is very easy to do. You do a QR decomposition of random uh, Gaussian matrices. And the task is to show that, uh, yeah. And then we relate the complexity. How do we do it? We deform every one of the gates, CK of theta, using the following proposed path, this. So every gate will have the worst case times the Haar unitary times F of minus theta H sub K. Now, 
this eight sub k is Hermitian, like I said before, and it's simply if you do a eigenvalue decomposition, these are the eigenvalues and these are the eigenvectors. And at minus one, at theta equals one, this will be f of minus h of k. It'll just be h k. Uh, what? It'll be h k dagger. So I'll cancel this, and you'll have the worst case circuit. And at theta equals zero, well, f of zero is just one over one. So you'll have c k times h k, and that is indeed, um, indeed, uh, random hard unitary. And with a little bit of work, you can show that um, every one of the entries is rational function so there is a there is a q of theta which is an overall normalization that only depends on the eigenvalues of little h sub k it is a polynomial of degree little uh, capital n and i recall that capital n is two or four and that p alpha of theta is another polynomial that only depends on the eigenvalues of little h and it is also a degree of capital n so every entry is a rational function of degree and, and, and maybe I should say that a rational function is just a polynomial divided by a polynomial. In a way, it's hard to imagine that you would have a polynomial, a rational function of lower degree, because the number of, I mean, you should at least have a knowledge of the eigenvalues of, uh, uh, of A sub K, right? I mean, there should be at least N. So um, there is the degree of numerator and denominator is both N. <clears throat> and we do this for every one of the gates. So now we have a real path that uh, starts at zero, and at, at zero it's har because it's ck times hk, and at one it gives you a worst case circuit, and it remains unitary for all theta. I mean, you can put theta equals 100, it's still unitary, because it's unitary times unitary times unitary. Um, and as a result, our circuit is also parametrized, uh, is theta parametrized, and the degree, if we have little m, um, if we have little m um, gates, when you multiply polynomials of the same degree, um, the degrees add, it's easy to see. So the degree of every entry of C theta will just be little m times n, little m times n. And we respect architecture, so some of this should be a reminder now. So we do this for every one of the gates. And this quantity is just the one one entry of c of theta which is an exponentially large matrix you take the absolute value squared the degree can just double right because i multiply a rational function of degree mn mn by its self complex conjugated the degree of numerator goes up the degree of denominator goes up by two so p0 of theta is just a rational function of degree 2mn 2mn and in order to make it work <clears throat> Uh, nobody asked this question, but um, the thing is, remember that algorithm O that we assumed works for average case instances? So there was an algorithm O that we said, suppose it works for average case instances. Um, that supposition is a little bit strong. The reason is that, you know, if it could work for any random circuit, how do we know that it excludes a particular choice of random circuit that is known to be sharply hard, right? I mean, that would just contradict itself. We cannot assume that it works for any average case circuit. It should succeed on most average case circuits. Because again, some of those average, some of those random circuits may coincide with circuits that are known to be hard. Well, so in order to do that, you want to say that if your algorithm succeeds with high probability, you can still ex you can still build that polynomial exactly. That is, you give it a theta i and it succeeds with high probability. So maybe for some points, it gives you the exact P0 of theta. And you know, one, every once in a while, with some vanishing probability, it really messes up. It gives you a P0 of theta that's totally off. Um, you, you like to hope that, and this is besides that epsilon neighborhood. It's, it's an entirely different thing. Uh, you, wanna show, you wanna show that even then you can construct a polynomial. Now what is absolutely remarkable in my opinion, maybe it's because I didn't know much about coding theory, and you know this whole was a was a was a new venture for me. But I found it absolutely remarkable is that there's a Berlick and Welch algorithm for polynomials, which does the following. Um, it is remarkable in that suppose it wants to suppose you want to construct a polynomial by giving it theta i's and having an algorithm that gives you p of theta i's. And suppose for you give it n points, 
well, let me not use what I've written here because, but let's think about polynomials. And suppose that you get, you, you query this algorithm n times, and you know, with some number of times, it gives you the exact answer, P0 of theta, and some number of times, it just gives you something that is totally wrong. And this was, uh, Berlick and Welch is remarkable in that it can still recover the, the, the polynomial exactly. And that's, that's amazing. Without knowing which points are bad, which points are good. If we knew which points are bad, we just toss them and make a new query. But it can still tell you, it can still construct a polynomial even if there's some rate of error. So this was in coding theory and it has its roots in Reed-Solomon codes where you encode the message in the coefficients of a polynomial, you transmit the polynomial, and the other, the other end of the channel, somebody should be able to reconstruct the polynomial, even if some of the coefficients are wrong, totally wrong. So this was interesting. So in order to make this work, since I have rational function uh, paths, I had to extend this algorithm to rational functions, and that's the statement of it. I mean, it's just to tell you some technical ingredients. You can see more in the, in the paper whose version two hopefully will be posted sometime soon. Um, so if f of theta is just a k1, k2 rational function, so the polynomial in the numerator is degree, polynomial of degree k1, the denominator is k2, then if you give it n tuples of theta i, f of theta i, and there exist t errors, two t errors, then still you can evaluate the polynomial. All right, so just the number of points needs to be larger than the sum of the degrees plus two times the t. Another point uh, is that you want to make sure that under the deformation, this uh, <clears throat> Cayley path deformation or whatever path you're using for deforming, you want to make sure that um, the circuits remain very close to Haar measure. That is that blue region I showed you in the reduction is indeed an average case circuit. And for that to be the case, you want to make sure that the distribution over the family of circuits that are built using this <clears throat> Cayley path deformation vanishes as theta vanishes. So to do that, I have to use some ideas from random matrix theory and uh, probability theory, et cetera, to show that indeed every one of the gates will be O of root theta close to the actual Haar measure. And by the additivity of um, 12 variation distance, the full circuit will be O of M is the number of gates times root theta close to the Haar measure circuit with the architecture A in 12 variation distance. And with these ingredients, we have a theorem that the actual P0, so if A is an architecture such that computing P0 of C is sharply hard in the worst case, that is known like, Bar like Terhal de Vincenzo or Bremner et al circuit, then indeed, it is sharply hard to compute some large fraction of those probabilities, even if C is from the hard measure respect to that architecture. That is the average case is hard. And this three quarters red herring, this can easily be boosted up to 15, 16, or whatever, 20 or 21. Uh, it's just to show that majority of the circuits uh, with high probability are hard. Now we go back to the, I can, I can pause here if there are any questions, then I'll talk about robustness. That is with respect to a little bit of error. If anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, you're welcome to. I'll drink a sip of water. Ice water. So guys, I cannot see you. I usually have a good way to gauge my audience by just looking at them. So either I'm doing a really terrible job and losing you, or um, it's too basic, <laughs> or I'm doing an incredibly clear job. <laughs> and I really um, doubt it's the latter. Uh, so let me know if you have any questions. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a very good talk so far, just to confirm you. Uh, it's tradition okay. that we don't show our, uh, our videos because we want to uh, make sure that uh, more shows, yeah. Okay, um, fine, up to you, yeah. I mean, I can continue, but you know, don't be shy um, if you have any questions. All right, thank you. So, <clears throat> epsilon, low, epsilon robustness. Recall that now we have proved, using Kelly Path or what have you, that this thing 
this polynomial, this, 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 not a polynomial, this rational function valued probabilities are indeed sharp be hard, assuming non collapsible polynomial hierarchy for theta very near zero. These are average case circuits. But what we need to show is how about if there's a little bit of robustness? That is, the algorithm assumes that P, P of theta i is, is computed to within some epsilon. Well, the great thing is that there is a result, like I mentioned earlier, that there's a neighborhood hardness, and I don't have any truncation. So you can actually just compute. So it's in the paper, it's a little technical. Um, but you can show that by extrapolation, you remain within the hardness region as long as epsilon is two of minus capital theta means it scales as. This is a, a big O notation or capital theta notation. Number of gates times delta to the minus one, which you can optimize. And if you solve it, then you get these sharp answers that for constant depth circuits, those probabilities are hard to compute up to error two to the minus n cubed. And for Google type circuits, which are root n root n grids with depth root n, um, these probabilities are hard to compute to two to the minus n to nine halves. So it's not, uh, and what is fascinating is that it seems like, I mean, it, the, it seems like this is, the, it may not be able to improve this, um, though that's a conjecture. So the quantum supremacy conjecture has been that the you epsilon, the, the, the P0 of C is hard to within two to the minus N over poly N, but the best I can do is two to the minus N cubed or two to the minus N to nine halves. But recent work seems to show that maybe this is, maybe the supremacy conjecture is not true for constant of circuits. I mean, I suspected that, but, uh, we have some numerical evidence, at least for constant depth, it, it, it's, um, yeah. I'll say a little bit more in a few seconds. Um, now what is appealing to bring it home is that random circuit sampling is really the strongest complexity theoretical evidence for hardness. And what was outstanding uh, for some time was to really prove the average case hardness of these circuits. So we had some non-unitary approximation of them that were proved to be hard by uh, Bouland at all. It's nice work. It was my, my starting point. But the actual point was not known to be hard and a robustness that actually worked for circuits was not known. And the reason random circuits are random circuit sampling, so that is you have hard measure gates, is attractive, is that we have an anti-concentration result for it. Now with this work, we have average case hardness and it's something that seems to be um, experimentally viable. So it doesn't, it doesn't have a discrete set of gates. It's the most generic quantum circuits you can think about. And these are the things that you can actually build uh, in the lab, like Google tried, Google did. And they seem to scale. Like for example, boson sampling does not seem to scale very well. I think it gets saturated at 22 photons and you need like 50. Um, and the bonus is that we have some proof of robustness, two to the minus n cubed that I showed you. Now, there are some open questions. One was the supremacy conjecture, whether it is true. You can look at the, this paper of Knapp et al. And if you want to see some further arguments, continuing the line of work I just showed you, you can look at Appendix A. One problem I'm very interested in um, is quite disjoint from this whole complexity theoretical mumbo jumbo. But you know, can we use Cayley path for other tasks? Like, can we, for example, use it for cryptography or circuit hiding? So I've been going around like for a couple of years trying to get people interested. So suppose, you know, you get, um, you have, you want to run an algorithm. So suppose, you know, you're at the position of a billion dollars and you want to, you know, um, I don't know, run some computations on a quantum computer and make another billion dollars. So you have some circuit you want to run. Maybe it's an optimiz optimization for, for your, uh, you know, a garage hedge fund. And you want to send this task to say IBM that holds this expensive quantum computer you can interface via the cloud, but you do not want to reveal your quantum computation. You want IBM to think that you're doing junk and send you answers. And then once you get the answers, you can piece them together and do something wonderful that makes you a billion dollars, for example. Well, you know, one thing I, I had hoped, um, I mean, I could actually construct this, but it just wasn't efficient. It was, ex ex it was, it was too expensive. One thing you can do is you can send in scrambled circuits, like using this Cayley path deformation. So as far as the server is concerned, you're running a random circuit, but they send you back answers 
and you can piece together those answers um, and answer your computational task, which would be wonderful because you know you have full security. Well, you have security, and you have answers to your problem. Um, I, I I found this not so bad to do, but like maybe my standards were um, too high. It just wasn't efficient, so I just never published it. But uh, you want to do something efficient, viable, that you could actually use for cryptography. Um, and I wonder if this Kaley path is optimal in some sense, because the numerics seem to indicate that if you try to uh, be more lax about those uh, error bounds, the um, additive error bounds I showed you, things kind of like become easy. Um, the numerics seem to show that they become easy on average. Or maybe, you know, other proof techniques beyond this Kaley path. So with this, let me salute you for your interest and attention. And thank you. And uh, take any questions, comments, whatever you may have. Um, thanks very much for a really interesting talk, Ramis. Uh, I'm going to give you a thank virtual you. clap because it was excellent okay. and very clear <laughs> uh, on a very non, a very difficult topic, actually. And you did a really great job of presenting this in a very clear and concise way. Um, so let me open the floor for more questions. Does uh, I, I lost voice. I lost the sound. I should have turned off <laughs> turn on my video. Do you Would hear anyone? me? Uh, yep. Yep. Can hear you. Yep. Um, so are there any further Nick, questions? I hear you now. Yep. Uh, okay. Great. I hear you now. Does um, can you, can you see any... more about the numerical calculations that indicating that in this supremacy regime it's conjecture to be easy? Oh, right. So uh, you mean this paper that I flashed? Uh, like you said, that uh, two to the uh, n cube and and two to the uh, n poly. Mm -hmm. um, right. So it seems like um, so <clears throat> so the numerical algorithms. You can look at this paper. Mm -hmm. it came out in twenty twenty actually. Maybe it's not twenty nineteen. It's twenty twenty. Um, and also the recent work by Alibaba Group that. You know, um, it's a classical simulation of quantum supremacy. So the if you say, look, I don't um, this this is hard, but you know, can I can I can I sample from a distribution that is close? That is, I allow myself some total variation distance, or you know, you allow yourself some uh, the variance, so you don't get the probability so, not so, so exactly, but with some error. Then it seems like, at least for constant depth circuits, um, there's also my work with uh, Bravi and Gossett, that constant depth circuits seem to be kind of easier than we thought. Uh, we thought constant depth circuits could be very hard because Terhal de Vincenzo shows that even for depth four or depth three, um, th in the worst case, they're very hard. They're like sharply hard. But so we thought also, you know, they have average case hardness. Um, maybe they do, but, but it seems like if you try to assume, if you try to prove quantum supremacy for constant depth circuits, um, just heuristically or just based on computation or some of the algorithms like that myself, Ravi and Gossett did seem to like work really well for a large class of problems. And this paper I showed you, Nap et al, shows that there exists some constant depth circuits that are universal. So they include sharply hard points, but numerically they can calculate um, probabilities to very small additive error or sample from output distributions with small total variation distance efficiently. Now, what is amazing is that if you try to make this little tighter to get, you know, so this is, I hope this is obvious that this epsilon is smaller than this epsilon. So if you try to make these errors smaller, somewhere around this point exactly, so if you do n cubed or n, um, the things that I have, these algorithms all of a sudden go from efficient to x time, exponential time algorithms. And I find that interesting. Okay, so and these are for uh, constant depth circuits, right? That's right. I mean, you know, in near term, I mean, look, right? I mean, for, how do you define constant depth? theoretical and... results are all asymptotic. We talk about X yeah. and poly and, you know, how things scale with N. Yeah, so but in reality, uh, we never what do you mean have by, asymptotic. By constant depth. In the near okay. term, root, like people, like we talk about how log N, you might know this. Like we know that mm -hmm. 
we don't know the power of constant depth circuits on average, but we know like log n circuits become hard. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I ask you the question. So suppose you have a million qubits, which we don't, right? We have like 50. But suppose you have a million qubits, and I tell you, look, pick between a constant depth circuit and a log n circuit with depth, depth constant or log n. Which one do you pick? I mean, I don't know. Like, I would take a constant depth 50 over log of n, which is six, right? In this case, the log of a million is like six. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit more, depending on what base you're taking. So in the near term, um, we're only, well, we always have some constant n. But indeed, these, uh, the algorithms that I have in, 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 the, in the paper I just mentioned are complexity theoretical results. Also in this paper, um, there exists a complexity theoretical result for a circuit with a very contrived architecture that is indeed uh, uh, hard in the worst case, but seems to not be hard on average. But there are also numerics in there, and the numerics are, you know, not proof. There are numerics, but they're good algorithms that seem to work. I mean, you can calculate, for example, a grid of 400 by 400 qubits efficiently, and that's interesting. Maybe 400 by 400, like a matter of minutes. Uh, that's interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I don't know if I this answers your question, but this is my uh, understanding of the numerical work that's been done. Okay, so if there are any further, uh, if there are no further questions, we maybe to thank Ramos again virtually, so everyone can give him a virtual clap and maybe. Okay. Thanks for thank a really you. excellent talk. Thanks, Mick. Bye, you guys. Bye, bye, bye.